Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Wendy Mae Davidson? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background in this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime and offer my analysis. Wendy Mae Davidson was born in Texas on July 23, 1978. Her father, Lloyd, worked in a factory, and her mother, Judy, stayed at home after being diagnosed with lupus. Wendy had a younger brother named Marshall, who was born in 1979. The couple lived on a farm in San Angelo, Texas. This is a rural area. The closest town of any notable size is an hour and a half away. The family had a wide variety of animals, including pigeons and parakeets. Wendy liked to care for the animals. When she was seven years old, she decided she wanted to be a veterinarian. Wendy performed well in school academically, but not as well socially. She graduated from high school in 1996, second in her class. However, she did not seem to have empathy for others and struggled to be accepted. Wendy started college at Angelo State University and worked at a veterinary clinic during summer breaks. Her brother Marshall would occasionally do maintenance work for a veterinarian named Dr. Terrell Sheen. When Lloyd lost his job at the factory, Dr. Sheen hired him as a contractor. Years later, Wendy would keep a horse on Dr. Sheen's ranch, which becomes important later in the narrative. Marshall would later find work as a game warden, so he became a law enforcement officer. Wendy completed her prerequisite courses and enrolled at Texas A&M to study veterinary medicine. During her fourth year there, she became pregnant. She terminated that pregnancy. She became pregnant a second time and had a son named Tristan on October 29, 2001. Wendy graduated in May of 2002. She went to work at an animal hospital in Abilene, Texas. The business was eventually purchased by a man named Dr. Larry Ellis. In his dealings with Wendy, he found her to be hard to manage. For example, she would not follow orders and would become hysterical when animals were scheduled to be euthanized. Dr. Ellis eventually fired Wendy for failing to euthanize a litter of kittens that had feline ringworms. Her failure to act resulted in 28 cats being infected and euthanized. Prior to being fired, Wendy became pregnant again and terminated that pregnancy. The day before Thanksgiving in 2003, Wendy met a man named Michael Severance at a bar in Abilene, and they went to her place afterward. Michael was born in Maine on July 20, 1980, so he was about two years younger than Wendy. He enlisted in the Air Force and was stationed in Abilene, Texas. He was a C-130 crew chief and was deployed five times to the Middle East. During their brief time together, Wendy became pregnant. She called Michael to let him know, and the couple decided to get married. At this time, Wendy was now living in Lubbock, Texas. She had found a job working for another veterinarian. This is about two and a half hours away from Abilene. Michael did not make the trip out to Lubbock to visit Wendy too often. She became concerned he was having second thoughts about the marriage. Despite this, their relationship persisted. Michael met Wendy's family in April 2004. It did not go well. Nobody liked him. Judy had a particular disdain for Michael. She described him as rude, disrespectful, and lazy. Wendy still wanted to marry Michael, even though her family despised him. Wendy had to move back to San Angelo after upsetting her employer in Lubbock, Texas. Her family helped her open her own veterinary clinic. Dr. Sheen was retired by this time, he purchased a building from another retired veterinarian and rented it to Wendy for $1,500 a month. Wendy's parents renovated the building at a cost of about $40,000. The clinic had a one-bedroom apartment inside of it. The plan was for Wendy and Michael to live in the clinic. They couldn't move during the renovations, so they lived with Judy and Lloyd. This only caused more tension for everyone. On September 1, 2004, Wendy had another son, Shane. Right after this, Wendy, Michael, and their two sons moved into the clinic apartment. Wendy and Michael married on September 13, 2004. 
Michael's father came out to the wedding all the way from Maine. He would later imply that Judy and Lloyd were impolite and distant. When Michael's father returned to Maine, he told other family members that he didn't understand why Michael put up with the terrible treatment. This takes us to the timeline of the crime. On January 13, 2005, Wendy and Michael engaged in an emotionally charged argument. Michael drove to Abilene with the two boys to visit friends. When he returned to San Angelo, Judy took the boys to her residence. Michael felt as though Judy was spending too much time with the boys. On January 14, Wendy and Michael decided to go to a restaurant for dinner. They were preparing for a family trip to Maine on January 16. They were going to fly out to visit Michael's family. After leaving the restaurant at about 7.40 p.m., the couple went to a bar that was right across the street from the clinic. They spent the evening there drinking and dancing. At this point in the narrative, Wendy is the only person who knows for certain what happened. Later, law enforcement would develop a theory. Here's what they said happened. After arriving back at the clinic from the bar, Wendy put five phenobarbital pills into a beer and served it to Michael. After he was rendered unconscious, she injected him with a veterinary euthanizing drug called euthanasia D, which killed him. She loaded his body into his pickup truck along with wire, fishing line, and a number of heavy items, like a concrete block. She drove the truck to the ranch owned by Dr. Sheen. She had keys to the gate because she kept a horse there. She backed the pickup truck up to one of the ponds on the property, dragged Michael's body onto a wooden platform on the edge of the pond, tied heavy objects to his body, and then rolled it into the water. Wendy then returned to the clinic. She opened the clinic at 8 a.m. the next morning, so this is Saturday, January 15. Not long after this, she canceled the airline tickets for the trip to Maine. Wendy called a member of Michael's family in Maine on Sunday, January 16, at 5 a.m., and asked her if she had seen Michael. Wendy claimed that Michael had been missing since Saturday. Her story was that she had taken the children to her parents at 3 p.m. When she returned, Michael was nowhere to be found. Wendy spent the afternoon of January 16 sleeping on and off at her parents' house. She didn't report Michael missing to the police until 6.43 p.m. The police visited the clinic. They noticed that Michael's pickup truck was in the parking lot. His cell phone was inside of it. Wendy told the police that Michael had talked about running off to Canada. The next day, Wendy filed for divorce and a restraining order. Perhaps she was concerned Michael was going to return from the dead and bother her. On January 26, Wendy made a search on her computer for information about body decomposition in water. She learned about how a dead body can float. She returned to the pond on Dr. Sheen's ranch and found Michael's body floating she used a boat to get out to his body. She stabbed his body 41 times so that gas could escape, and she tied additional heavy items to it. She then dumped his body back in the pond and returned home. On March 5, 2005, the police interviewed Wendy and told her they knew about the computer search and the trip to the pond on the Sheen property. Wendy became particularly agitated when they mentioned the pond. The police made their way to the pond to conduct a search. When they arrived, they had to stop Wendy from entering as she was trying to get through the gate. I guess she didn't waste any time getting there. Later that same day, Wendy called her family and told them she was being chased by someone. She asked them to meet her at a local cemetery. Marshall arrived at the cemetery first. Wendy told Marshall no one was actually chasing her. She had made that up. She had something she needed to tell him and her parents. She wanted to wait for all of them to arrive before revealing it. Marshall insisted that she reveal it immediately. Wendy said that she didn't kill Michael, but she found him dead and panicked. Rather than calling the police, she disposed of his body in the pond on the Sheen property. As I mentioned, Marshall was a game warden. He decided to call the police and tell them what Wendy said. He made a wise decision. Right after the police arrived at the scene, they overheard Wendy saying to her family members, I didn't kill him, but somebody did. I thought one of you did it, so I moved the body to protect you. Wendy was brought in for questioning, but would not talk to the police. 
The pond on Dr. Sheen's ranch was searched, and Michael's body was found. Wendy was arrested for tampering with evidence. She was eventually released on bail. She was charged with murder after the autopsy results came in. Drugs used by veterinarians were found in Michael's system. In addition, the police discovered that Wendy had falsified documents to explain what happened to the drugs that she used to kill Michael. She said that she had given this massive quantity of drugs to a chihuahua named Wheezy, but this was not true. No chihuahuas were harmed in the course of this crime. This is the old blame the chihuahua trick. If she wanted to hide a large quantity of drugs, why didn't she pick a larger animal, like a cow? Why pick one of the smallest animals that she would treat? It doesn't seem like she really understood how to create a proper diversion. The diversionary chihuahua is rarely a good choice. In October 2006, as part of a plea deal, Wendy pleaded no contest to murder and was sentenced to 25 years in prison, as well as 10 years for each of two counts of tampering with evidence. The time is to be served concurrently. Wendy was eligible for parole in 13 years. She was denied parole in 2019 and is eligible again in 2024. She will be released by 2031 at the latest. Now moving to my analysis. Wendy Mae Davidson appears to have a number of characteristics, including impulsivity, sensation-seeking, arrogance, a sense of entitlement, social awkwardness, and a tendency to be irresponsible. She was intelligent, yet made bad decisions. Her emotions interfered with her earning potential, but her parents saved her career by funding her clinic. It appears as though there was this dynamic in her family where she expected them to always look out for her. This is exemplified by her calling them and believing that they would be happy to become accessories after the fact. Wendy misjudged her family's level of loyalty toward her. When they would not lie for her, she turned on them, suggesting that one of them had murdered Michael. Yet she still attempted to paint herself as the hero for trying to protect them by disposing of the body. We see this theme with Wendy that she really doesn't understand the idea of a two-way relationship. Wendy was always right and didn't have to listen to anybody. Other people were just there to help meet her goals. She falsely accused her family members. She would not follow the orders when she worked in the veterinary clinic. She mistreated Michael and didn't defend him to her family. And she murdered Michael. Moving to the next question, was Wendy Mae Davidson guilty? She maintains her innocence. She even gave an interview from prison during which she tried to explain her behavior. Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that Wendy Mae Davidson was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. It has been established that Wendy disposed of her husband's body after he was dead. When she knew his body was about to be discovered, she attempted to blame her family. Wendy had access to the drugs that killed him and falsified documents to account for those drugs. The nature of the murder suggests that Michael trusted whoever killed him. Someone could have surreptitiously approached him and injected him with a drug, but chances are he was given some type of poison in a drink first. Wendy had the best access to him. It makes no sense that one of her family members just happened to swing by the clinic to have a drink with Michael. Also, Wendy would have been there. What opportunity did any other potential killer have? She should have seen the other killer. Moving to the exculpatory evidence, there are no witnesses to the murder and no video. No physical evidence connects Wendy to the crime. Members of Wendy's family had access to the clinic and therefore to the drugs. Wendy's parents made it clear that they did not like Michael. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Wendy was guilty? I think she was guilty in reality and guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Even still, I can understand why the state offered her a plea deal. Trials are expensive, and the plea deal guaranteed a sentence of 25 years. The fact that Wendy's family hated Michael could have created a reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury members. I think that her family's aversion to Michael is what allowed her to get such a good plea deal. Moving to the last question, what was Wendy's motive? The prosecution said that Wendy did this for insurance money. This is possible, but the argument they had before the murder and the timing of the murder makes me wonder 
if there wasn't another motive. My theory is that Michael was starting to push back on the way he was being treated. He was in a land of enemies. Wendy didn't like him. Her family didn't like him. And on top of this, Judy was spending a lot of time with the boys. I think he was starting to assert himself with Wendy to let her know that he didn't have to follow her rules or even stay married to her. I believe that Wendy was nervous about the upcoming trip to Maine. Here, Michael would have been surrounded by supportive family members, people who could give him perspective, people who he could talk to about his bad marriage, people who may have advised him that he had other options, like moving back to Maine. I think that Wendy was threatened by Michael becoming more independent and confident. She wasn't about to risk custody of her children or to risk her money. It was all about Wendy maintaining control. She had a lethal sense of entitlement. Those are my thoughts on the case of Wendy Mae Davidson. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as a diversionary chihuahua. Thanks for watching.